Welcome, a pleasure to serve you. I am Emma Davis. A look at our stories. Ghana recorded the highest interest rate in Africa in 2023, despite a decline in treasury bill yields. According to fixed income updates by some investment firms, the rates of about 29.24 and 31.88% for the 91-day and 182-day treasury bills respectively remain high. Here's a business desk report. The yields on the 91-day and 182-day bills fell by 6.12 and 4.10 percent respectively last year. However, the rates are still elevated, increasing the government's cost of borrowing on the domestic market. Despite the rates falling significantly in March last year due to the domestic debt action program, the fall in the yields was short-lived. Again, average lending rates hover around 32 percent, ranking Ghana among the highest on the African continent. However, some analysts are hopeful Treasury yields will decline in 2024, potentially sharper along the year as investor sentiments improve. They have warned that election-related fiscal risks and its pass-through effects on inflation remain a risk to the outlook for the yields. Meanwhile, Egypt followed Ghana closely with the second-highest interest rates in Africa. Seychelles, however, has the lowest interest rates in Africa. Government has been urged to demonstrate political will by chasing informal sector workers to pay realistic taxes to the state. According to senior country partner of accounting firm PwC, Vish Ashabo, there is a real challenge in roping more Ghanaians onto the tax net. Hence, the difficulty in achieving the tax to gross domestic uh, product target average of 17% in Africa. Speaking to Joy Business, Mr. Ashabo believes government must push more to overcome this challenge. The informal sector is hard to tax. Data is part of the issue, but also identification, access to people, and just the level of effort that is required. I think that's uh, part of the challenge. But honestly, you also heard one of our panelists talk about the will, or let's say the, I wouldn't say the lack of will, but the, the level of will. Uh, because if you have to go and chase the masses uh, to pay taxes in an election year for any government, that is uh, a delicate issue to, 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 to tackle. So. There is some of that. There are real uh, difficulties, but also the will or the resolve could be more, uh, more intense than it currently is. Now, research lead at GCB Capital, Courage Putti, says governments must be strict on spending, particularly discretionary items in order not to erode the recent economic gains. According to him, this would help re reduce election-related fiscal risk and its effects on inflation. He spoke to Joy Business. It's a risk no one can completely rule out, and I can understand why. You could see the projections for the year that even in CAPEX, we've seen some significant growth in CAPEX, and it's not hard to think why we are in an election year. Maybe uh, there is some focus on infrastructure and other things like that. Um, it has political capital, and it has, of course, social value as well. So it's, it's, it's here and there, right? But what we have seen in 2023 that worked was that revenue net did not necessarily perform. There were uh, revenue underwhelmed to some extent, but there was that commitment to trim expenditure and normally on the discretionary items. Uh, and that is for how we managed to keep the fiscals in check and even ahead of the, the uh, uh, program targets really. Uh, going into 2024, we haven't paid as much interest on the local bonds. In fact, we have to negotiate them down. Uh, external debt service will resume once we conclude uh, the debt restructuring. It brings on another set of ob obligation. And so um, government would have to even be stricter on the discretionary expenditure items if revenue continues to shortfall. Now, will government be willing to do that? And in an election year where spending is a key part of, of the process, those we cannot say for certain, and that is why it remains on uncertainty uh, as to how the disciplinary mechanisms of the mm. program can keep us in check. And we had program in 2016 when we had overruns, really. So how the program can keep in check, in check and most importantly, how the authorities see the exigencies of the situation we are in and the need to 
if you like, tightening our belt and get things back under control. Depending on how they see that and how committed they are to that process, we could see uh, 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 sustaining the fiscal trend we are seeing now or the overruns that uh, uh, a lot of other people are also are leading to. Now, Nigeria is leading Ghana in terms of the frequent use of digital channels for financial transactions. That is according to the 2023 KPMG West Africa Banking Industry Customer Survey. For instance, 70% of customers in Nigeria use their mobile banking app at least once a week, compared to 53% in Ghana. Here's more. The overall outcome of the survey indicates that Nigeria is ahead of Ghana in the use of digital channels for payment and other forms of transactions. Again, 43% of customers in Nigeria use automated teller machines weekly, compared to 32% of Ghanaian customers. In terms of USSD, 40% of customers in Nigeria use this medium for banking transactions, while only 28% of Ghanaians do same. Regardless Regarding the importance of online banking, 78% of corporates and 52% of small and medium enterprises in Nigeria emphasize the significance of their bank's online platform. In contrast, 61% of corporates and 44% of SMEs in Ghana expressed similar sentiments. KPMG explained that the evolving digital landscape in West Africa is dramatically altering its financial ecosystems. Mobile connectivity has surged exceeding 100% in both Ghana and Nigeria, with the surge sparking a profound shift in the payment sector. Meanwhile, Chief Executive of eTransact Ghana Limited, John Apia, says the limited digital infrastructure and reluctance by the public to adopt digital channels of transactions are the main reasons why Ghana is still a cash-based economy. Reacting to the 2023 KPMG West Africa Banking Industry Customer Survey, which points that Ghana uh, as a predominantly cash-based economy, Mr. Pia said more innovative products must be offered to convince customers to adopt digital transactions. I, I'm one of the few people, I think, who hardly carries cash around. Um, but if you look at it, even to do with like reading of books, you know, we still like to have the the hard books the hard back that we can touch you know is it, it requires a particular mind shift and um, that doesn't happen overnight um but that said there are some challenges um we have a limited digital infrastructure um in this country we have a low financial literacy in this country um and we have a low trust you know the use of money is built on that fiduciary agreement that trust in, in what you're holding you know and with what happens around with cybersecurity, et cetera, there's very low trust in, in the system of moving money digitally, you know. So all those issues, I think, together uh, are, are some of the main challenges that we see in, in, in being able to promote a more digitally inclined economy. But now, let me just add that despite all these challenges, the most important thing is to provide value. Um, if you can provide value to the consumer, mm. you know, if you save the, the customer time, you know, for instance, in the past, when you're sending money to Kumasi or Takwade or what have you, people will give money to the STC driver who then give the money when they get to their destination. But sending money digitally changed that overnight, you know, where now I don't need to send money through someone who takes three or four hours to get to someone else. Just by the click of my phone, within 10 seconds, I can do that. What does that provide? That provides convenience. That provides convenience, that provides speed, and the person still receives their money. So despite the challenges, there's a need for us to see how we can be more innovative with the products that we offer and, and how to ensure that the products that we offer actually touch a particular need of the customer. Now let's touch on a developing story as the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport International, a prominent global professional body for logistics and transport, has appointed Chief Tete Ousunoti as a, a, a distinguished Ghanaian as its new international president. This momentous occasion marks a significant stride for the organization, welcoming its first ever African president, 
since its establishment in 1919. Chief Tete Usunote brings an extensive background of experience and unwavering commitment to his new role. Having been a member uh, of the Chartered Institute for nearly three decades, he has held various leadership positions within the Institute. His profound understanding of the global logistics and transport industry positions him as the ideal candidate to lead the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport International into its next chapter. He joins us via Zoom. Hello, Chief. Welcome. Congratulations. Thank you very much. The honor is mine for having me. Okay. You have just been appointed as a global president of the Institute. In brief, what is the organization about? Thank you. CLT, that's the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, is a global organization under the Royal Charter and our headquarters is in the UK. We are currently in about 40 countries and still counting. And um, it's a membership organiza organization. And our core mandate is to promote the arts and science in logistics and transport through education. We are currently um, in about 13 institutes or institutions in Ghana where we train our members. And among others are KNUST, Gimpa, Accra Technical University, just to mention a few. Mm. I'm told you are the first black African and Ghanaian to rise to that office since 1990. How did you do it and how do you feel about it? I feel humbled. And as a Ghanaian, because um, it has been a long road to travel, but permit me to use the the, the a short bypass to um, to let you know that it's not been that easy. It has been by the grace of God who helped me, and also tenacity, hard work, and uh, perseverance. I joined the institute in Ghana in 1999. And I was privileged to um, organize one of our global conventions where we played host to her Royal, Royal Highness Princess Anne in 2007. I mean, I have an advertising marketing background, so I happened to run the event. I was a go between Ghana and the Buckingham Palace. And after the event, the performance was clear. So I was appointed the international vice president responsible for Africa. So I was carrying on that role until years after I was appointed to be the first black advisor on the Council of Trustees. Four years down the line, after playing the advisory role, there was the need to appoint a president, which was a global president. And before you appoint a president, you have to, you have to serve as a president-elect. So the bid was open, I put in my application among 15 members from 15 various countries who were shortlisted to five, and I came on top. So I've always wanted to change the narrative and to tell the story of Africa in a different way. And I'm very happy I'll be able to achieve it as a Ghanaian, as an African. Mm. Talking about changing the narrative, what do you have for Ghana and the continent at large during your presidency? My vision as a global president hinges on um, these three thematic areas because my predecessors have laid a solid foundation for CLT to continue to be the leading voice for every profession in the industry and sector. And therefore I will solidly build on it. I'm not, to, I mean, change the wheels. So my first task is for ACLT have been the leaders in the industry. It is my vision to solidify our brand and image for a greater recognition. Secondly, I'm convinced we are now living in a new world at a time unlike any other and um, where a lot is dependent on our profession. Therefore, tenacious pursuit of excellence in transport, logistics, and supply chain leadership across the globe is what I seek to achieve. Thirdly, I also have a shared conviction that it is time for Africa's growth and advancement. I will deploy a strategic partnership to support the growth of the African continental free trade area. That's the after that we all know. Fourthly, every CLT professional practicing in Ghana and in other continent Africa and globally must uphold standards and excellence under my presidency and beyond. Then I also want to champion the growth and development of the next generation of professionals, especially women who have made the career in the male dominated area like logistics, transport, and supply chain. Finally, one of my strategies is 
in achieving all these is through strategic partnership and collaboration. With my almost 30 years in travel across the world, I've had the privilege to harness key relationships and enough experience to make my presidency one of a living legend as the first African to assume the role since 1919. Talk of African continental free trade, can you give us a sneak peek of what to expect from you, a little detail of what you'll be doing exactly to help uh, Ghanaians take advantage of the, the area? Very well. Now, transport and logistics is one of the pillars that the after secretariat hinges on. And it is my dream and vision to leverage on that and with my experience for the continent to make sure we achieve that very, very successfully for us to be a learning curve for the other continents to emulate. Mm. There has always been the concern that moving within Africa has been a challenge. It's more expensive, you know, than going overseas. How do you intend to reduce the cost of logistics within Africa? It's a collective collaboration amongst the key stakeholders. So just as I said, mine is to build partnership, build collaboration for department agencies, countries, business to business, business to government, for us to sit and agree on how to ease movement of people and goods across the borders. Mm. Thank you very much. Titi Usunote is now the president of the Chartered Institute for Logistics and Transport. You're still watching Business Live with me, Emma Davis. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome, let's touch on one of our headline stories. Chief Executive Officer of the Chamber of Agribusiness Ghana, Anthony Morrison, says government is likely to focus more on non-food items this year due to the incoming elections, and this could have dire consequences on inflation. According to him, certain critical sectors of the agricultural industry are likely to be neglected, even though there are calls for government to safeguard the country's food security. He spoke earlier on the market, please. In election year, government looks at certain critical sectors of the economy. And uh, the agriculture sector is normally negligent. Uh, for instance, uh, they look at roads because those are the obviously conspicuous uh, physical items that uh, voters look at. They look at hospitals, they look at education, schools. Uh, the agriculture sector is normally not looked at in election year. And um, the issues of GAU, the concerns being raised by my brother Edward, uh, are the same concerns. Uh, and even more on the side of the agribusiness sector. Because uh, in election year, we see a lot more if importation of non-food items. And uh, you, you're going to see in the coming months, how the non-food items are going to uh, contribute towards the inflation. For instance, importation of uh, uh, campaign materials, vehicles, and several other things, and uh, how this is going to have negative consequences on food. But sadly, with reference to the budget that was read, you also realize that the sector has been projected to have contraction. And um, very also sadly to also note that certain critical sectors of the industry, poultry, uh, vegetables, grains, uh, if you look at the, uh, the budgetary 373 uh, pages, you realize that we have also imported over $300 million of pepper, okay? So for me, it's a grave concern, especially if you look at the amount of money that has been allocated for the agriculture sector in this year's budget. Mm. One would be at the fact that we are working to attain certain level of food security. And for that matter, there is a need to make higher budgetary allocation. But in this year's budget, uh, we are actually expecting less. Uh, meanwhile, we are being told that our population is increasing. Our importation, food importation bill is increasing. And our food inflation uh, is also quite very high, probably the highest uh, in the sub-region or the West Africa uh, or in Africa. 
Now, the dean of the University of Ghana Business School, Professor Justice Baole, is blaming the low productivity in the public sector on high job security. According to him, the process of laying off staff in the private sector makes it easier for individuals to put out their best to secure their jobs. Reacting to a new human resource report by the Chartered Institute of Human Resource Management, Professor Baole said productivity can improve if proper systems are put in place for employing or laying off staff in the, in the public sector. On uh, a turnover, we actually saw that the government sector has less turnover. In other words, people are not leaving the government sector as, as fast as they leave the other areas. So if you check, for example, mining had a very high turnover rate. Um, I was asking the, uh, the uh, gentleman that did the report uh, about, for example, the hospitality sector, which is one of those areas that has very high turnover. But the government sector has, if you like, a certain level of security. It is also perhaps one of the reasons why productivity may be low, because it's so difficult to take away a staff in the public sector as compared to what would happen in the private sector. Such so that if somebody wasn't giving off their best, it is easy in the private sector to dispense of them. In the public sector, it's much more difficult. And so you are likely to have a lower return on investment in the public sector than it is on the, in the private sector because people feel very secure and as a result they may not give out their best. That will be all for today on Business Live with me, Emma Davis. For more business news, do log on to myjoyonline.com. Have a good evening.